we are grateful for your holy word. Lord, we ask that you would give us the, the courage to submit to what you have commanded us to do. God, we know that sometimes it is difficult. Sometimes following Jesus costs us a great deal. Lord, but we ask that you would fill us with hope and strength as we read your word this morning. That your Holy Spirit would empower us to glorify you in every area of our lives. But I know this is going to be a difficult passage this morning, and so I ask that you would help me to explain it well, to proclaim your truths well, so that my brothers and sisters here would be built up and not discouraged, but that they would be filled with encouragement and joy to know that this life is not our home, that this world is not our home, this life is not the end, but that we have a home in heaven that is waiting for us. We love you, and we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, 1 Peter 2, 18 through 25. Let me read this to us. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure? This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Here's the main idea today. The main idea, Jesus' people should be willing to suffer unjustly because Jesus, our example, suffered for us. Let me say it again. Jesus' people should be willing to suffer unjustly because Jesus, our example, suffered for us. So here's the command. Verse 18, servants... Be subject to your masters with all respect. And the words translated servants and masters here refer to the legal institution of slavery, which was in full swing back in the New Testament era. And so what Peter is saying here is, slaves submit to your masters. Slaves submit to your masters. Now it's worth noting that slavery in those days was a lot different from American slavery It was a lot more voluntary, and it pretty much had nothing to do with race. But it still existed. People owned and had legal rights over other people. And this is not the only place that the Bible commands slaves to submit to masters. Titus 2, 9 through 10 says, Bond servants are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They are to be well-pleasing and not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith, so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. Or Ephesians 6, 5 through 8, bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ. Not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord, excuse me, as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bond servant or is free. And the Colossians 3, 22 through 24 says, Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters. Not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. Now, this is hard. I'm going to be honest with you. This is a hard command. Now, praise God, slavery no longer exists in America. Right? I'm, the Bible is not saying slavery is good. But the Bible is not focused on the issue of slavery or freedom. It's not focused on physical slavery or freedom. How societies organize their politics and class systems is not the focus of Scripture either. Because although it does speak to what is right and wrong in those relationships in God's sight, the Bible transcends culture and class of specific nations because the people of God are a worldwide, transnational people that includes individuals from every tribe, tongue, and nation. And so the Bible is not written specifically to Americans or Europeans or Africans. And so the Bible does not command us to fix governments 
or to make certain political moves. Instead, it calls us to glorify God in our lives wherever we are, whatever we're doing, and to focus on making disciples of all nations rather than trying to fix those nations. Setting people free from spiritual slavery is the focus of Scripture. And in so doing, as we do God's will and make disciples and people are set free from their spiritual slavery to sin, if God wills, then governments are brought into line with what is good and right and just. Because the individuals then who make up those governments are changed from the inside out through the gospel and by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we celebrate when governments act according to God's commands. But even still, Christians are not primarily a political force. We are not primarily agents of social change. The church of Jesus is not just a voting block. We're the bride of Christ and the mouthpiece of God and the priests of the Most High. We are beloved sojourning exiles, pilgrims passing through this temporary life on the road to our eternal heavenly home. And so we are looking forward to a time where all things will be new and right and fixed, but we are not there yet, and we won't be in this life. And so our aim in this life, in whatever situation we find ourselves in this world, is to do right, obey God, and proclaim His excellencies, as Peter has already said, to everyone at all times. And everything else takes second place. So there's no cause ever that justifies sin. There is no injustice that calls us to forsake the glory of God in order to fix it. As God's people, we are act, or excuse me, we are called to act God's way always in everything that we do. And that's not to say that we can't be advocates and activists, because we probably should in a lot of situations. If you see something which God calls evil going on, and you want to speak up against that thing and work against that evil thing, then do it. Go for it. Be blessed in doing it. God is glorified when we defend the defenseless and take up the cause of widows and orphans and when we speak up for the marginalized. But do not forget your primary mission as you do it. Don't forget that first and foremost, we are ambassadors of Christ to a world in need of reconciliation with God. Remember what 1 Peter 2.12 has already said. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. So when we advocate, when we participate in activism, we must always do it in a way that honors God because the world is watching to see if the Christians are really any different than they are. And so Christian, do, do, not, do not participate in rioting or burning down buildings or flipping over cop cars, even if you're protesting against an evil government because that itself is evil and wicked and does not glorify God. Yeah. We don't threaten and curse and scream because that is wicked and it has no place among God's people. We do not sell our soul to the secular world for temporary political gains. We don't compromise our conscience for short-term wins because this life and this world are passing away and we are called to glorify God in our short time here. So instead, Peter tells us, slaves, submit to your masters with all respect. And why? Because slavery is good? No, slavery is evil. But, as Titus 2.10 says, so that in everything you may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. He's saying, in essence, slavery exists, and as long as it exists, here's how Christians operate within it for the glory of God. Christian slaves submit to their earthly masters because the world is watching and looking for a reason to accuse us of being evil, and we don't want to give them any opportunity because we want people to see our lives and see the goodness of our God and glorify Him. Because that is why we exist. The glory of God. What the Apostle is getting at is this. Jesus sets us spiritually free so that our circumstances, excuse me, so that in our circumstances, whatever they may be, we can bring Him glory. So if, God forbid, you find yourself in slavery... Even as you seek your freedom, and you should and you can, even as you long to be free from an earthly master, and you should and you can, even in all that, you submit to your masters for the Lord's sake. For the Lord's sake. And if you thought that was a hard enough command, 
he ups the ante in, in the rest of verse 18. He says, we submit not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. In other words, we're not only commanded to submit to good masters who are trying to be fair and kind and good and gentle, but also to unjust masters who beat us for no reason. And he gives us the reasons why we're supposed to submit to those unjust masters, thankfully. Because we've already hit on this a little bit, but, but here's verses 19 and 20. He says, this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. This phrase, gracious thing in the sight of God, basically means something that God looks at favorably, something that pleases the Lord. And now we're moving past the slave and master relationship into a general principle, which is number one, God is pleased by us when we continue to obey him even when we're being mistreated by the world. Let me say it again. God is pleased by us when we continue to obey him, even when we're being mistreated by the world. Because if we deserve to get beaten, we don't really gain anything by taking our licks with dignity, because we deserve it. And now we get it, and we're not really any better off. We're just even, so to speak. But when we do good and we suffer for it, when we don't deserve it and we get it anyway, when we endure that with dignity and grace and submission, then God is pleased by us and glorified by us. And we can turn those horrible instances of persecution and mistreatment into worship by being mindful of God. We can have peace in knowing that God is glorified in us as we obey him. That God sees us and has a plan for us to use it for our good and for his glory as he has promised us in Romans 8, 28. We know that for all those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. But thankfully, Peter doesn't just leave us here either. As though we were the only ones who've ever suffered unjustly. Instead, he points us to our prime sufferer, to our Savior, to Jesus. Verse 21 says, For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you. So number two, we must be willing to suffer because Jesus suffered for us. We must be willing to suffer because Jesus suffered for us. And this is the basic storyline of Christianity, right? Jesus died for our sins. And what Peter's saying here is that Jesus' suffering for us serves as a call to come and suffer with him. And Jesus says this himself in Luke 9, 23 through 24. He said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. No matter what the prosperity preachers may tell you, the call to follow Jesus is a call to come and die. And in that dying to find true life beyond this life. Because, brothers and sisters, if you have come to Jesus looking for heaven on earth, you're not going to find it, because heaven is coming, but it's not here yet. But what you will find instead is peace with God, and hope in Christ, and love in the church, and a joy that transcends your circumstances, along with sometimes sickness, and poverty, and hunger, and a bunch of enemies who hate you because they hate your Savior. But also, you find the strength to endure Whatever God has appointed for you, whatever suffering he has ordained for you, he will strengthen you to endure it because you've been bought back from sin and darkness and your soul sickness has been healed. So you can suffer joyfully, not enjoying the suffering, that's not what I'm saying, but being joyful despite the suffering because Jesus has already been there. Verse 24 says, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. That's a nice way of saying that perfect Jesus had to die on a cross to redeem us. And I don't want to rush past that, that he bore our sins in his body on the tree. Because in order to pay for our sins, the perfect son of God had to die the most horrible death ever concocted by human beings. He was nailed to a cross and hung there until his body shut down for us. Because sin is not mistakes and foibles and uh uh-ohs. Sin is wickedness and iniquity and evil, and it requires God's wrath. 
And I worry that we've so softened and candy-coated the true nature of sin that we don't really understand this anymore as a culture because it doesn't really compute that foibles and mistakes require the wrath of God, right? We say, oh, well, we're all human. We all make mistakes. Because sin requires death and hell and eternal conscious torment. But if our sin is wickedness, like I've said, and iniquity and evil, then we deserve God's wrath. It requires God's wrath. A God that crushes people for their mistakes sounds mean, but sin is not just mistakes. Sin is willful rebellion against a holy God. And a God that looks the other way at that kind of wickedness would not be a good God at all. He would be unjust and evil himself. And that's what we all are in our sin is wicked and evil sinners. True repentance requires that we realize who we really are in our sin Because if we just think of ourselves as a little bit broken, instead of depraved in mind and heart and flesh like the Bible says that we are, then we're going to have the incorrect view of ourselves as being able to stand before a holy God in our own goodness and our own merit, yeah, with just a little cartoon Jesus band-aid on our tiny little mistakes. Instead of correctly understanding what the Bible says, that we have desecrated God's holy law and that the only righteous thing for God to do with people as depraved as us is to toss us into outer darkness forever. Because sin is not small. Sin was so big that it required the horrific death of the Son of God on a cross in order for it to be wiped away. And you and I now have been offered pardon for our crimes against God. And not a pardon that we earn, right? Because how could we ever be worthy of the life of the Son of God? We are offered pardon instead by God's grace. Because Jesus bore our sins in, the body on the, in his body on the tree, now God can offer us complete forgiveness. And it's by faith and faith alone that we take hold of it. Because human beings are not good deep down. Deep down what you find in every human heart is just more wickedness. And so we need a ransom, and we need a rescue, and we need redemption, and we need pardon. And we have it at the cross of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. The cross is sufficient. He bore our sins in his body on the tree. It is enough. By his life and death and resurrection, the sins of every believer are wiped away. Yes. The Son of God has borne our sins, every single one of them. And as we take hold of him, he takes hold of us, and he forgives us thoroughly it is complete forgiveness and our pardon is sure and certain and finished but God offers us even more than pardon because Jesus died and rose again we can now die and rise again with him verse 24 says he bore our sins in his body that we might die to sin and live to righteousness so that's a we were sinful we were sinful but now we're righteous We were sinful, but now we're righteous. Jesus died, and we die with him, so that we die to sin and live to righteousness. Galatians 2.20 says this, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. That's right. He chose us. That's right. And we die with him, and we rise with him, so that spiritually now we are no longer who we were. Yes, sin is dead in us, yes, and now we are righteous in Christ. That's right. That's right. But it also says, by his wounds we have been healed. By his wounds we have been healed. We were sick, and now we are healed. That's B. We were sick, and now we are healed. Isaiah 53, 4-5 says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken and smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and by his wounds we are healed. And this is not talking about physical healing necessarily, although any time God heals a person by his grace, it is because Jesus has purchased that grace for us. But what he's talking about here is the sickness of our transgressions and our iniquities and our our chastisement that we deserved. We are sick, or we were sick with sin, but now in Christ we have been healed. We were healed spiritually by his death for us. 
Verse 25 says this, For you were straying like sheep, but you have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. So that's C. We were lost, and now we're found. We were lost, and now we're found. Again, to continue in Isaiah, because that's what Peter's doing here. Isaiah 53, 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So again, the picture is like a scattered flock of sheep just doing whatever they want all over the place, getting eaten by wolves, falling into ditches, falling off of cliffs, eating poison. That's right. But now in Christ, we have returned to the shepherd and overseer of our souls. We come back into the pen of God's goodness and his grace and mercy by the blood of Jesus. Jesus now is our good shepherd. And so we were lost, but now we've been found. So that's what it means when we say that he suffered for us. He rescued us from sin and soul sickness and our lostness. And now we are righteous and healed and found. And so... To go back now to verse 21, the reason that we suffer unjustly, the reason we're willing to suffer unjustly is because of Jesus. It's, verse 21 says he left us an example so that we might follow in his steps. So now we looked at what Jesus suffered for us in order to accomplish. Now let's look at how Jesus suffered for us and the example that he set for us to follow as we suffer with him in this life. This is how we're supposed to do it. So big number three. Jesus showed us how to suffer righteously. Jesus showed us how to suffer righteously. Amen. A is this. Jesus suffered for us without sin. He suffered for us without sin. It says he committed no sin, verse 21. He committed no sin. Jesus never once sinned. Even as he was dying on the cross, he did no wrong. And so he becomes now the standard for our righteousness and for our righteous suffering. The temptation that I feel, or that I think that we all feel, is to make excuses for sin in the midst of suffering, right? Well, I'm just really stressed, so I'm going to do this bad thing. I've had a really bad day, so I'll just take it out on my wife. Or everybody hates me, and so I'm just going to, you know, click on some internet sites that I know I shouldn't be on. I'm going to go drive down the highway like a maniac or give in to my despair or go ahead and steal this thing because I deserve it because I've been suffering. But the truth is we should be looking to sinless Jesus as our example and our help. He's not just an example sitting up in heaven saying, you guys better figure it out. And he's our help. Hebrews 4, 15 through 16 says, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. Amen. Without sin is a good one to start with because it immediately points us to the reality that we cannot do this on our own. You cannot suffer like Jesus in your own power. You need his help and he offers it to you. If we're going to behave like Christ, we're going to need his help. We're going to need to draw near to the throne of grace and draw on the power that only God provides. So B, here's the next way that Christ suffered for us. He suffered with integrity. He suffered with integrity. It says he was without sin, but neither was deceit found in his mouth. In other words, Jesus didn't lie his way out of his suffering. And neither should we. Again, the temptation is a very strong one when we realize that our faith is about to cost us, right? Or that somebody is about to, somebody's about to come and and lay a smack on us. It's easier to deny Christ like Peter than to bear up under the suffering. And yet we do not have the option of denying Christ. We don't have the option of lying our way out of unjust suffering. Instead, we're supposed to maintain our integrity. Remember, so that When the world speaks against us as evildoers, they will see our good deeds and justify our God on the day of visitation. See, we suffer with love. Jesus suffered with love. We must also suffer with love. And now it's getting even harder. Verse 23, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. You're saying, well, where does the love come in there? Well, because of Matthew 5, 43 through 45, when Jesus says, you've heard that it was said... You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, 
Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. We've got to love our enemies, and that's what Jesus was doing. Jesus was hated by the Pharisees. He was horribly mistreated by the Romans. They reviled him. And yet as he was on the cross, seeing those who had so abused him, he looked on them with love. Luke 23, 34, and Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. Right? They just continued to hate him, and yet he, he looked on them with love and compassion. And so even we, as we suffer unjustly at the hands of evil people, including our earthly masters, if we find ourselves in that horrible situation, we aren't allowed to hate them back. We are not allowed to return the abuse that they heap on us. Instead, we have to love them. Now, it doesn't mean that we have to remain in a dangerous situation. If you can get out, you get out. But you can't then turn and hate that person when you're out. We've got to love them. We should realize that even while we are headed for an eternity of joy in the presence of God, those who hate us and abuse us are headed for an eternity of torment in hell. And we should love them. And pray for them, as Jesus says, in the hope that they might repent and find forgiveness for their mistreatment of us. And this one really requires God's help because this is not something that we naturally want to do. It's not something that I want to do. When somebody treats me horribly, my first instinct is not to say, you know what, I hope that, that God blesses you. And yet Jesus says that's what we have to do. We pray for those who persecute us. But it takes a supernatural work of God's Spirit to give us love for our enemies. But that's what we strain for and pray for and hope for and work for. We don't return hate. We return love. Here's D. Jesus suffered without threats of revenge. Jesus suffered unjustly without threats of revenge. It says when he suffered, he did not threaten. As Jesus was being tortured and nailed to the cross, he could have easily been screaming at them about what was going to happen to them when he came back. Right? Because Jesus knew he was going to rise again. He could have been saying, you better wait in three days. I'm going to come and get you guys. But he didn't do that. Instead, like Isaiah 53, 7 says, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In fact, the only things that came out of his mouth were prayers to God and blessings on those who were treating him so horribly, who were killing him. Jesus took it without threatening. And then here's E. The biggest one, I think, or the one that ties it all together. He entrusted himself to him who judges justly. And so E is entrusting ourselves to the good judge. We suffer with Christ, entrusting ourselves to the good judge. Because remember, the foundation of all of this is the fact that this life is not the end for us. As believers in God, as, as Christians, as those who belong to Christ, this world is not the end for us. Because if it is the end for us, as the Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, we are of all people most to be pitied because we have wasted our lives. And yet, we know with confidence that this world is not the end. The end. And so we are able to suffer with a view toward the future, entrusting ourselves to Him who judges justly. Romans 2 6 through 8 says this He will render to each one according to his works, to those who by patience and well doing, who, excuse me, to those who by patience and well doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, He'll give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and don't obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. For those of us who are in Christ, our sins will have been washed away on that day. And God, in his judgment seat, will not miss a single sin. We're all going to stand before God one day. And if we're in Christ, our sins will have been dealt with. We will not be guilty before God because Jesus will be our covering but for those who hate God and persecute God's people and do not repent, they will be punished for their sins. That day is coming. But it's not up to us then to take judgment into our own hands. That's God's. That belongs to Him. Instead, we give it over to the Lord. 
we entrust ourselves to him who judges justly. Because every sin will either have been paid for at the cross or will be paid for by the criminal. A day of judgment is coming, and as we suffer, we would do well to look toward that day instead of this one. We entrust ourselves to him who judges justly, just like Christ. Now, before we get to the very end, let me, let me say this, this little caveat on, on suffering unjustly. The Bible is not commanding us to go looking for ways to get beaten or to provoke the world to mistreat us, okay? We're not, we want to be careful that we don't say, the more you suffer, the holier you are. That's not what the Bible is saying. Instead, what the Bible is saying is, we're going to suffer at the hands of unjust masters and an unjust world. And when we do, which we will, when we do, then we are able to bear up under it in a godly way that glorifies the Lord because Jesus has already done it. He's been there before and he empowers us to do it. But let me say one more word on this. If you are suffering, if you are being beaten or persecuted or mistreated, God is not saying, be silent about it, never tell anybody, and just endure it with joy. Okay? If you can get out of the suffering in a godly way, do it. That's, that's good and right. right. If you are in a situation where you're being horribly mistreated by somebody, and you can get out of it in a way that's not illegal or a way that doesn't dishonor the Lord, you can come out from underneath that suffering. Right? Yes. That, that is good, and it is healthy, and it is right. If you're being persecuted in a country that it is illegal to be a Christian and you're worried your family is going to be killed, it is okay to leave. That is okay. But it is also a gracious thing in the sight of God if you're looking forward to eternity and saying, if I die, I go to be with Christ, so I'm going to stay here and bring as many with me as I can. That is also righteous. Those are both options for the Christian. Whatever way we think we can glorify God best, whether it's by obtaining our freedom, so to speak, or by remaining in that suffering for the glory of God and the good of others. The point is that we glorify God with our lives. That we are no longer the center of our world, but that Christ is. So, here's my last thoughts. My last thoughts. Maybe you're hearing this and this is kind of a gut check for you. Because this is, this is not easy, right? Especially in America. We, we are bombarded by messages of the world saying, You deserve the best. You know, you're, you're so good, you just need to love yourself better. Whatever is happening to you that you don't like, you know what? You just go and you better get revenge on those people. But Jesus says, no, we don't do that. Maybe you're like me and you want revenge when someone mistreats you. Or you have the attitude that, well, nobody better mess with me. We have a better example than that. We have a higher calling than that. Jesus set an example for us by suffering unjustly for us. And more than an example, he set us a standard and an expectation. But maybe you're also like me in that you regularly fail to live up to Christ's standard. Because I don't think there's any of us that looks at this and says, oh, that's a nice, neat checklist for my life. I have always suffered without sin, with integrity, with love, without threats of revenge, and entrusting myself to God in every situation. Probably none of us are there, right? I'm not. I'm sure not. And yet, and yet, praise God, this is not a list to make sure that you can get into heaven. Instead, this is the standard of our God who suffered for us so that we who are sinners could be made righteous. Don't leave here today thinking that you are unique in failing God because you're not. Or, or, or don't leave here today thinking that your failures have ruined you forever because they haven't. There is grace at the cross and his grace is new every morning. See, we don't just need the gospel to get us started in the Christian life. We need the gospel to keep us going. Because it's not like you come to Jesus, get a blank slate, and then have to figure it out on your own. It's not like that. Instead, the Bible says that God makes us the righteousness of Christ. We become God's righteousness in Christ. And so on that foundation that Christ has already made us new, he has justified us fully in God's sight by faith, let me encourage you that you keep moving. You keep striving. You're not going to exhaust the grace of God. If you failed yesterday, come to Jesus, repent of your sins, and start again with him today. Yes. The blood of Jesus has covered you, 
and it is enough for every sin. We are justified before God by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And it's from that foundation that we live lives of freedom and righteousness before God. And here's the last thing I'm going to say. If you're not a believer, these things don't apply to you. If, you, if you're here today and you're rejecting Christ, you're living in unrepentant sin, I don't want you to go and feel comfortable in your sin and your rejection of God. Because God has not saved everyone. God saves those who put their faith in him. God saves those who leave their sin and come to Christ for forgiveness and grace. He saves everyone that repents of their sins and comes to Christ for forgiveness and grace. But only those who come in repentance and faith. And so today, if you're here this morning or you're hearing my voice, do not let today pass you by. If you're feeling this and you're saying, you know what, I am a sinner. I look at Jesus' suffering and I am not like Jesus. Congratulations, you are seeing the truth. You're not like Jesus. You need him to save you. And because he died for sins, he can save you. And he is the only one who can save you. So repent of your sins and run to Christ. And he will save you this morning. Let me pray for us. Lord God, we, we are sinners in need of your grace, every single one of us. And we're grateful that, Lord, if we have trusted in Jesus, if we have come to the cross of grace, that we are pardoned completely. Lord, we ask this morning that from that place of pardon, that you would enable us, empower us to live holy lives, to live lives of submission to legitimate authority in our lives for your glory. Lord, we ask that you would give us a perspective change so that we could see that this world is not the end, that the, the goal of our lives is not to protect our rights, but to glorify our God. Lord, strengthen us, empower us, enable us, live through us and in us so that we can glorify you because we know that we can't do it on our own, that we need your help to live this holy life that you have called us to. And so Lord, as we strive, we trust that you will fulfill your promise to strive with us, to empower us, to make us holy like we want to be. Lord, I ask that you would give us the strength to bear up underneath persecution if it comes that you would strengthen our brothers and sisters around the world to submit to earthly masters, to earthly governments, not for their glory, not for the glory of their masters or their government, but for your glory alone. Lord, if there's anyone here today who is not in Christ, who thinks I'm crazy, who doesn't see their need of a Savior, Lord, I ask that today you would open their eyes to see the truth, yes. that they would know that they are sinners in need of a Savior and that the only Savior is Jesus Christ. Lord, we love you. And we ask all these things in Jesus' holy name. For your glory alone. Amen.